from information design that apply not only to posters, but also to figures and visualizations of data. And what we'll see is that a lot of these principles apply at every scale of resolution in which we think about how we design for the communication of information. So to give just an overview of what to expect for today's session. So I'm gonna start with a, a lecture that introduces some key information design principles um, that are applicable to poster design, as well as to figure and visualization design. And it'll sort of be a whirlwind tour of many different examples and sorts of tips for thinking about how to improve the design of any kind of figure or visual or poster. And then after that, the second part of the event today will be workshop oriented. So you'll be broken out into small groups and you'll be given the task of designing a poster based on the principles that I introduced in the first lecture portion. And then after that, you'll have an opportunity to do some critiques of the poster designs that you create in your, your workshop groups. And at the end, we'll wrap up. I'll offer some additional resources for future learning and answer any questions that might be lingering along the way. So I'm going to start with, again, this whirlwind tour of key principles in information design. And I want to start this tour with a provocation. And that provocation is that when we think about the ways that we communicate our research, the ways that we communicate our scientific data, right? There are many different ways of capturing that communication in terms of a single visualization, a figure that appears in an academic journal article or a poster. And in the context of posters, it's important to remember that our readers experience of any poster that we design starts, it begins long before our audience even steps in front of the poster in the first place. So a common place in which posters are presented are these big academic conferences. And they're, we're all familiar with these gigantic symposia where there are all these posters spread out throughout a giant room. And before anyone sort of even comes up to your poster, they see something about your poster from a distance. And that thing that they see is the first impression. And that first impression can go a long way in terms of inviting your, your audience to come take a closer look or discouraging them from coming and asking you more questions. So the experience of the way we communicate our information is distributed in dimensions beyond just the bounds of the poster or the figure that we design. So it's worth thinking about a poster as being sort of a visual abstract for communicating our research. And if it's a visual abstract, then it's something that's worth being designed and thinking critically about how we design that thing. So since an abstract presents information, it's worth designing that visual abstract for information, for communicating that information. And designing for information itself means designing for the visual, the spatial, and the temporal dimensions of our reader's attention. Again, sort of all these different dimensions of how people interact with the thing that we're trying to communicate. So I wanna talk about three key dimensions of communication that can be improved through some simple principles of information design. And those key dimensions include composition in terms of balancing and aligning content, hierarchy using color and typography for wayfinding, and then finally storytelling, which is how we sort of construct the narrative of our poster or our figure at the levels of microscopic, mesoscopic, and macroscopic levels of resolution. So I'm gonna start with composition because composition is really one of the key entry points for how anyone comes to interact with any sort of representation of information. So that's especially true for how we design a poster, for example. When I talk about composition, I'm referring to the visual arrangement of content, where it appears on the page or on the canvas, and how that content is distributed over all the space and time that's available for it to be distributed. 
So there are some key techniques we can use to improve the composition of any sort of figure or poster. Those include white space, alignment and justification, and then finally exploiting Gestalt principles of perceptual organization. So I wanna start this discussion by presenting an example of an infographic that does a really good job of exploiting good composition to make the figure more readable. So this is an infographic that presents a series of different visualizations about some data related to um, incidents of HIV in the United States. And it's worth noting that when we look at this visualization, this figure, one of the first things that we notice is that there's a lot of stuff in this figure, in this infographic, but it's not overwhelming. And it's not overwhelming because the content is arranged in very clean, orderly, and logical kinds of ways. So if we were to take this infographic and break it down into its individual regions of content, so here I've placed a gray rectangle over every place there's some text or a visualization. It's worth noting that there's white space in between these gray regions. And the white space plays a really subtle but incredibly important role in helping us make sense of what's going on in this infographic. So the little amount of white space in between the regions of gray Right, those are necessary to provide some sort of epistemic spacing between all these different slices of data that are being presented. And the white space also helps imply a grid arrangement of the content. And that grid arrangement of the content makes it easier for us to group the content in rational ways. So when we see that grouping that's enforced by the use of white space and this grid, that grouping is important for giving the reader some cues about the order in which to read the infographic. So for example, we might read all these different chunks of text and visualization from left to right and from top to bottom. So here I've drawn some arrows to suggest one possible sequence through which we might read this infographic. And that sequencing of contents, right, that's a representation of how our reader's attention is not only composed over the spatial um, sort of distribution of content on the page, but our reader's attention is also composed over time. And that composition over time is created through sort of this implied order of reading that we expect our reader to look at our infographic. Here's another example of an infographic that uses composition very effectively. So here we have, again, a lot of content. There's a lot of information being presented. It's a very dense figure. But again, if we draw rectangles on top of all of the different regions of content, we see that there is a grid structure to this infographic as a whole. And the regions of content, very importantly, are related to one another by consistent ratios. So all of these rectangles, they aren't just random sizes, but we can relate the sizes of, of those rectangles in sort of these consistent ratios. And that use of consistent ratios in terms of one rectangle being twice the width of another rectangle, for example, is what helps build sort of this implicit grid system into the composition of the figure. So when we compare these two different examples here, they both use grids to compose the content. But in the example on the left, we have an explicit grid that's formed by this use of uh, regions of consistent ratio-based um, chunks of content, as well as explicit lines separating those chunks of content. Whereas on the right example, we have an implicit grid and that implicit grid is created by using white space. So white space and grids play a really, really important role in making our figures and posters more readable. One of the reasons why grids are so important and so useful is that they help distribute content. And in the process of distributing that content, it makes it easier to balance the two different kinds of primary types of contents that typically appear in figures or posters. 
And those two primary types of content are text, the things we're actually saying, and then the images, which might be figures, visualizations, photographs, that provide a visual counterpoint to the text through which we're trying to say what we're trying to say. So we can use grids and composition to balance the content in anything that we design. And balancing content means many different things. It means leveling the cadence of text and image in the order in which our poster, for example, is read. So for example, in that previous uh, infographic where we had the different rectangles and the arrows showing the order of reading, it matters that there's an order of some text first, then a visualization, then more text, then another visualization, and we sort of go back and forth like this. And that cadence helps sort of break up the wall of text phenomenon that is very common in figures and posters. So that's one way to balance content. Another way to balance content is to distribute content evenly across the available space of a poster or a figure. And lastly, we can exploit axes of symmetry and alignment. So a very easy way to instantly improve the composition of a poster, for example, is to take the total available space of a poster and subdivide that space into segments. And those segments should be related to each other by simple and consistent ratios. So on the screen here, I have six different examples of different ways you might break up a poster into different sections. So we can have multiple columns. On that first top left example, we have a title at the top of the poster and then two simple columns. Once we have individual columns, we can break those up into individual segments, maybe break one column into two half segments. We might break our layout into rows, and we might combine row and column organizations. Notice that in all of these examples here, all of the different gray rectangles, they're all similar to each other in that we can relate them all to each other by consistent ratios. And the consistent ratios are very simple. So for example, in some situations, we have a one-to-one -one ratio where the size of one rectangle is equal to the size of another rectangle. And in other examples, we have a one-to-two ratio where one rectangle is twice the width or twice the size of another. So again, really rely on simple and consistent ratios, and that will easily improve the quality and readability of your poster. Keep in mind that the negative space between segments in any sort of composition like that is really important too. It's important because it gives the visual anchor point that makes the grid or column layout perceptible in the first place. So don't forget that another way to think about the visual design of your poster is based on the negative space between the actual content. And a useful exercise sometimes is to take a completed poster and then draw rectangles around all of the contents and then fill in all the negative space with a color and see if that gives you a clear idea of the order in which someone should be reading your poster. So negative space is also very important. Another very common strategy in composition is to exploit axes of symmetry. So on the two examples on the screen here, we have a very clear vertical axis of symmetry where there is a prominent visual, a figure, that sits in the middle of the page. And that figure extends from the top of the page to the bottom of the page. And then the space on the left and right side of the figure is used for text. And in this example here, the axis of symmetry is again very, very simple. And that's a general point in all of information design is that in many cases, simple composition is better. Unless you really know what you're doing in terms of creating a very complicated kind of layouts, generally speaking, the best results you're going to get are going to come from very simple arrangements of content. So you can imagine using a vertical axis like this to organize the content on the page, 
You could have a horizontal axis that does the same thing. Here's an example of a poster that um, leverages this axis of symmetry to balance the content in it. So in this poster, there's a lot of content. There's some text, there's some figure, figures, but there's clear delineations between those segments of content. So if we were to, again, draw rectangles over the text blocks in this poster, there are two things we notice. So the first thing we notice is that all of the text blocks are exactly the same size. The second thing we notice is that these text blocks are aligned to one another in this grid pattern. So we can draw straight lines between the rows and the columns of these text blocks. And that combination of alignments plus consistent equal sizes of text blocks sort of implies this grid-based composition, which makes it easier for our audience to understand what's being communicated through the design. And then we have these figures that are in the middle of the, of the poster design. And these figures, they're located pretty centrally around that central vertical axis of symmetry. And this is deliberate because placing the figures here helps break up some of the flow of the text content. So that slight bit of breaking up of content by inserting these figures goes a long way in terms of providing some visual intrigue into the poster design. And that helps sort of reduce overall fatigue when someone is reading our poster. In contrast, this example doesn't use a very clear organizational structure. There is inconsistent distribution of text and figures. So again, if I were to draw rectangles around all of these chunks of content, it's not immediately clear where we start reading in the poster, unless you assume left to right, top to bottom. And at the same time, there's no central axis of symmetry that's very clear, which makes it hard to know the order in which we should be reading the, the chunks of content in the poster. So again, the lack of negative space here, or the unequal distribution of negative space has a, a big consequence for the overall readability of the content in the poster. Now, these things like white space alignment and grids, they're really easy ways to improve the composition of a figure or a poster. And the reason why these things work so well is because they exploit these things called gestalt principles of perceptual organization. And Gestalt principles come from the world of art and design, and they describe the common ways through which human visual perception tends to uh, in, take some content and then group the content together to make sense of what's being communicated through that content. So there are several different Gestalt principles. The two principles that are perhaps most important in the context of poster and figure design are the principles of proximity and similarity. And the principle of proximity just says that when objects are close to one another in a figure or a poster, our perception tends to group them together as being part of the same unit. The principle of similarity says that when objects look similar in terms of their appearance, our perception tends to group those things together as being part of a single unit. Now, proximity and similarity are really important to be aware of because they play a really influential role in how we group content. And in a poster, grouping content is extremely important because we often have so much information that we're trying to communicate at one time that we need to provide some cues, some visual cues about how the reader should be grouping all these different disparate pieces of content that we're trying to throw at them. So we can exploit these principles to improve the perception of grouping in a poster. So going back to this last poster example I showed a few slides ago, one of the reasons why this poster design doesn't work super well is that if we look at the negative space around all of the chunks of content in the poster, right? so all of this black ink here, this is the negative space around the primary content. 
That negative space is not evenly distributed. And that lack of even distribution results in making the groupings of the chunks of contents really unclear. And when those groupings become unclear, the poster becomes difficult to read. So some really simple ways to exploit Gestalt principles in the context of poster and figure design is to, first of all, just use really easily perceptible baselines to align content. So when you have different chunks of content, you should be able to draw a straight line that connects all of those chunks of content together. Or you should be able to draw a straight line between several different chunks of content and have the distribution of those chunks be symmetrical around a central axis. So again, you should be able to draw straight lines between uh, your chunks of content. So that's one really easy way to immediately improve the quality of a design. And then the other thing you can do is to think very carefully about the amount of padding you put between chunks of content. So providing enough padding between elements can go a long way in terms of improving the readability, not only by reducing the apparent density of what we're trying to communicate, but also to help reinforce the groupings that you want the audience to understand when they look at your poster. So these are super simple ways of just immediately improving the quality of a design. Now these things like alignments, white space, composition, grids, they provide an overall way of organizing the content in a poster. But when we do things like exploit Gestalt principles of grouping, we're doing more than just organizing content on a page. More importantly, we're composing hierarchy. And when I say hierarchy, I'm referring to the levels of structure that organize content in any sort of design. And that level of structure helps guide our audience's attention through that content. So thinking again back to that previous example of there's some chunks of content and the reader's eyes move through that content in a certain order, that's possible because there's an implied sense of hierarchy. And it's that hierarchy that's telling our reader's eyes where to go next. So that question is something we should always be asking ourselves when we design a poster, for example. This question of where should my eyes go next? Because oftentimes the answer to that question is very obvious to us as the designers, but they may not be immediately obvious to the people reading our poster or our visualization. And this is really important because in the sciences, we're often working with extremely complex data. And so hierarchy can be a way of building wayfinding into how to navigate through that complex uh, information. So I want to talk about two ways of creating hierarchy in a poster or a figure. And I want to start with color, because color is one of the easiest ways to instantly improve the readability and clarity of a figure or a poster. It's also one of the most immediately accessible or understandable or noticeable aspects of any design. And the way that we use color to create hierarchy is we use color to provide regions of contrast. And those regions of contrast help give visual anchor points that again, help guide our reader's attention through the complex information that we're trying to communicate. So here's an example that uses a color very effectively, but in a very minimal way. And in general, as a general principle, the less you use color or the more minimal color palette you use, the better the design. And the reason for that is because the fewer the colors, there's less that our brain as the reader has to keep track of in terms of figuring out what does this color mean versus what does that color mean. So in this example here, this infographic, the color palette is limited to gray, which is the primary color of the overall figure, purple, and then yellow. And that sequence of gray, purple, yellow is quite intentional 
because it guides the eyes of our readers. The purple and the yellow very distinctively stand out against that gray primary color. And so we might be encouraged to pay particular attention to those places that are annotated in purple or yellow. So again, using that as sort of a, a means of wayfinding that tells our reader, where should our eyes go next? Here's another example. This is a visualization that shows changes in average temperature per day per year in the city of Tokyo. And this visualization uses color in a very dramatic way. And specifically, it uses color, a diverging color palette, to emphasize an increasing warming trend over time. And that warming trend is represented through these bright reds and bright yellows. And those bright reds and yellows can't be ignored when we're looking at this visualization, because they really pop out against the other poles of the color palettes, those lighter and cooler greens and blues. So here, again, color is being used to tell the reader, what should I focus on in this visualization? So I want to talk about some tips for choosing good, effective color palettes. And the first tip I have is to use colors that are easy to distinguish. And this might seem obvious or common sense, but it's incredibly easy for us to forget that this rule is important, especially when we have all of these different tools and software that creates visualizations for us, creates posters for us, and offers color palettes. In many situations, the color palettes that our computer software offers are not great color palettes. They're based on very general use cases. And so just asking the simple question of, can I differentiate these colors can go a long way in improving the quality of your design. So as an example of when this can go wrong. So at the top of this slide, there is a, a color palette with four colors. And for the most part, the colors in this palette are pretty easy to distinguish, ranging from a darker green to a brighter yellow. And the steps of color between those two endpoints are pretty easy to distinguish for the most part. But if we take that same color palette and then interpolate between the start and end points into a sequence of 10 colors, it becomes much more difficult to differentiate the adjacent colors in this new color palette. And this is a common thing that happens when creating visualizations, for example. We'll start with a certain number of data classes in a figure and then create a color palette that works well for that fixed number of data classes. And then we realize we want to add in more data classes and thus need to extend our color palette. And sometimes what we do to accommodate that is we extend the color palettes on the inside of the color palette as opposed to going outside the color palette. And just being aware of the fact that this problem can arise means that you can notice it when the problem might occur in your own designing. So in general, when it comes to designing figures with color, it's best to use really a total of four to six different colors. That's really ideal. You can use a few more than that, but just keep in mind that the more colors you put into a figure, the harder your figure is going to be to read and understand. Ultimately, you really shouldn't be putting more than 12 colors in a figure, because at that point, it's really hard for any person to easily differentiate what all those different colors might mean. If you have too many colors in a figure, it's best to try to transform your data to reduce the number of data classes so that you have to use a fewer number of colors. So in that case, it's a matter of deciding what exactly do you want to communicate through your data? And do you need to show all of the data or can you show just a single slice of the data that allows you to leverage a simpler color palette? When it comes to the design of a poster, my best advice is to start by choosing only two colors, just two. So one color should be the primary color. And that primary color is used for the backgrounds, section headers, and anything else in the poster that takes up a lot of space. 
The other color in your color palette should be an accent color. And the accent color is specifically for accenting, meaning it should be used very sparingly and only for situations where you want to draw specific attention to your poster. So on this screen, we have two examples of very simple color palettes that demonstrate this. So in both of these examples, we have a primary color, which serves as the background. And then we have an accent color that's used to do things like accent specific numerical values. Optionally, you can also add a darker version or a lighter version of your primary color and maybe one additional color for encoding another part of the text content in your poster. But that's really the most that you should be using in a poster. So the smaller the color palette, the more readable your poster in general. Both of these posters demonstrate that. Right? So both on the left and the right, we have very small color palettes. But the colors that are used in these color palettes provide really clear visual contrast. And that visual contrast is extremely important because then it's immediately clear what purpose these different colors in the color palette serve in the first place. So in addition to using colors that are easy to distinguish, it's also a good idea to use colors that are accessible. And in the context of accessibility and color, a very common thing we need to think about is color blindness. So a lot of color palettes that are offered or suggested by desktop software for creating visualizations, those color palettes are often not designed with color blindness in mind. So for example, of what happens in color blindness. So here on the left, we have a, a rainbow color palette with some greens, blues, reds, the entire spectrum of hues. But this color palette gets flattened in really unexpected ways in any form of color blindness. So in the perception by someone who's colorblind, we lose the distinction between the yellows and the reds or the oranges and the reds. We lose the distinction between the blues and the purples. And if we're using these colors to encode data values or signal specific functional aspects of our poster, that's going to cause problems. And that's something we need to anticipate. And in most situations where we're working with grayscale, we have to be even more careful because any color that we use in grayscale gets lost entirely. And so sometimes people who are looking at our, our visualization or our poster, they might want to print out a copy of the thing that we design. And maybe they can only print out that figure or poster in black and white. And if you're using color to encode anything in that design, the person who printed out your, your design is not going to see any of that use of color, which means the message you're trying to communicate may be lost completely. So that is true for color blindness, but it's also true of just general human color vision in general. So something to remember, something to think about is that when humans perceive color, we don't perceive color in uniform ways. In the spectrum of the rainbow spectrum of colors, there are certain colors that appear to us to be brighter than others and therefore draw our attention a little bit more dramatically. So that's true, for example, of the color yellow. Turns out that as humans, our eyes are very sensitive to the color yellow. So anytime yellow appears in a figure or a design, our eyes are instantly drawn to it. So here's an example of a visualization. This is a choropleth map that could benefit from an improvement in color choice. So I've intentionally left out the color key for this, for this figure. And if we just look at this figure without that key, we might draw a specific conclusion from what the colors are telling us. And that specific conclusion might be that there's a sharp divide in values between the east and western side of the country. Now, if we put that color key back in, the apparent sharp divide between east and west 
actually doesn't encode a significant difference in value. Instead, that sharp divide actually encodes equal steps in value between colors. So we see that if we look at, for example, the green to yellow range of this color palette. So each of those differences in colors encodes exactly the same size step in the data. And so in this situation, the choice of color palette is actually betraying what the data are actually saying, all because in human perception, we don't interpret colors in naturally uniform ways. So for using colors that are accessible, it's a good idea to utilize perceptually uniform color palettes. I'm gonna show a tool in a moment that gives you some examples of these. But a perceptually uniform color palette is a color palette in which every single step in color is perceived in exactly the same way in human perception. So these kinds of color palettes are generally good to use. When you have to represent a difference in value through color, such as through an encoding and a visualization, it's always a good idea to select colors that vary mainly in brightness over hue. And the reason for that is because humans are really good at noticing changes in brightness in color and less good at noticing differences in hue in color names. In general, if you don't need to encode data through color, then don't use it at all. Choose other ways of encoding data to avoid all of these different complications that come with using color. When it comes to posters, it's a good idea to use color palettes that provide really strong visual contrast, especially between text color and background color, right? You wanna make the text actually readable because that's the stuff that's communicating the data in our poster. Now, when you choose color palettes for strong visual contrast, we do have to be careful about color uh, interactions because some interactions, some combinations of color that may be high contrast result in very painful combinations that are painful to our perception. So some examples of interactions to be aware of are things like simultaneous contrast or contrast of hue, these ways of positioning certain combinations of colors against each other. These things, these combinations can produce optical illusions that get in the way of accurately interpreting a figure or a poster. So on this slide, I have some examples of different kinds of contrast. So on the left, we have strong contrast, but still really good legibility of the text. So in that simple example, we have contrast between black and white and sort of alternating which is the background and which is the foreground. And on the right side of the continuum, we have still strong contrast, but despite the strong contrast, we have really poor legibility of the text. So this is where I say that be careful about strong contrast, because generally speaking, we want strong contrast, but sometimes certain forms of contrast can produce these color interactions that actually detract from the readability of our poster. So lastly, last tip for choosing a good color palette is to use colors that are semantically relevant. And when I say semantically relevant, I mean being careful about what exactly color is encoding in a figure or a design. So to understand this, it's important to understand that humans perceive color in three primary dimensions. In terms of the hue of the color, the name of the color, red, green, blue, for example, the saturation, the magnitude of that color, and then lightness, which is the quantity of white in the color. So when we perceive colors, we perceive them across these three different dimensions. These things matter when it comes to choosing color palettes to correctly encode different kinds of data in our research. So there are three primary types of color palettes. We have sequential color palettes, diverging and qualitative. And these different kinds of color palettes are useful for different kinds of data. So sequential is useful for continuous data that increase or decrease in a single direction quantitatively. 
Diverging color palettes are good for numeric data as well, which might be continuous, but that go in opposite polar directions of value, increase or decrease. And then we have qualitative color palettes, which use different hues, which are good for categorical or nominal data. A lot of times, tools that offer color palettes for our data offer color palettes that don't make sense for the kind of data that we're encoding. So one common mistake is to use a qualitative color palette that differs by color hue to encode a nominal variable, but where that color palette also has changes in lightness. The reason why this is problematic is because in this color palette we see here, we have different color hues. We have blue, orange, green, red, et cetera. But inside of those color hues, we have different levels of lightness. And the different levels of lightness, because they have the same hue, will be grouped together in our perception. So here's an exaggerated version of that. If we were to use a color palette like this to encode purely nominal data, then there might be sort of implied ordinal relationships between the values in our data. And just something as simple as not using these variations in lightness can go a long way in improving the color encoding. In posters, color can be used to signal differences between functional units. So in this example, there's a simple color palette. And one of the colors in the palette is a strongly contrasting color, sort of this bright salmon color. And that's used specifically and only for signifying section headings. Meanwhile, a lighter color is used as the background color for all the main text areas. So we can use color in this way to signal different functional aspects of our poster. Now, a couple of quick tools for selecting better color palettes. Our Color Brewer, there's a link here. That's great for finding uh, perceptually uniform color palettes. And then Paletton is a color palette picker where you set an initial color and then it gives you some suggestions of complementary or adjacent colors that you can use to construct your own color palette. And these tools give back colors that are in other forms that are often um, beyond what the standard color palettes are provided by desktop software. So we're mostly familiar with names of colors like orange, light green, or turquoise. But in the context of computer representations of color, we also have hex codes and RGB or red, green, blue values. So these tools like Color Brewer and Paleton give you things like hex codes that are very customized to the very specific colors you want to use. And these hex codes can be entered into something like Microsoft PowerPoint or Adobe Illustrator to specify you want to use that color as opposed to one of the preset named colors in the color palette. So just be aware that there are many different representations of color and don't just rely on the color names provided by the tools we use to design. Now, one more thing I wanna mention about hierarchy is that in addition to color, typography is also very important. So typography refers to the design of everything textual. That includes the typeface, the text size, the text weight, and everything else that is textual in nature. So good type should be pleasant to read and never distracting. So an easy way to ensure this happens is first of all, don't mix and match typefaces unless you really know what you're doing. And second, stick to a single type, either serif or sans serif for all the text and focus on variations of that text through size, weight, and color. So when I talk about serif and sans serif fonts, these are two of the major classes of typefaces in typography. And serif fonts have little feet at the end of the characters. So things like Georgia, Times New Roman, and Baskerville are examples of serif fonts. And then sans serif fonts don't have those little feet. They're smoother in general. Things like Arial, Helvetica, and Gil Sands are some examples. 
With typography, we can build hierarchy just by playing around with simple and consist consistent manipulations of weight, color, and size. So here's an example of a bunch of text that has no typographic hierarchy. Just by changing the weight of the headers, the italic style of the dates and times, and the spacing between sections, we've built into the design a very clear way of understanding, oh, this is the title of the event, this is the date and time, and here's the description. So again, very simple changes like this can go a really long way in improving the quality of design. In a lot of visualizations or figures that we see in academic articles, we tend to see a lot of different typographic styles thrown into a single figure. So here's an example of one such figure that has a lot of different styles, different italicized styles, font weights, a bunch of different sizes and colors. And that use of diversity in typographic style is distracting. So after we redesign this figure and really make that typography more consistent, it's easier on the eyes. And again, that easier on the eyes piece is important because often that will be the determining factor in, de in deciding if someone's going to continue reading your visualization or not. In this poster, there's just one typeface used for all the text, the main body text, as well as the headings. So that typeface is a sans serif typeface, but other dimensions, such as the variations in size and weight are being used to help differentiate that same typeface as having a serving different functional purpose in the poster. In this example, we have typography that's used to articulate boundaries between sections. So the titles of the sections, the headers of those sections are all sans serif typeface and capitalized whereas the content, content text is all in a serif font. So this is an example of how to use two different typefaces in a very deliberate way. One typeface for the section headings and the other for the main body text. When working with type, remember that our readers are gonna notice inconsistencies in spacing and alignments, even if that's subconscious. So every carriage, every character that we write in our text, including carriage returns and tabs, plays a really important role in deciding if our content is readable or not. So here I've drawn lines around the endpoints of these chunks of content. And just by ensuring that the bullet points are aligned, right aligned, it makes it a little easier to identify all the text in that section as, as belonging to a single group. In terms of annotations for figures, it goes a long way to align annotations, callouts along a central axis of alignment. So in this figure, I've drawn a vertical line that shows a clearly perceptible axis of alignment for those labels of the figure. And again, very small minor changes, but that have uh, immense ramifications for how we interpret a figure. This last example here uses color as well. And color is also an important part of typography. And here color is used to annotate these different sections of the visualization. Now, one minor note about accessibility in typography. In general, sans serif fonts are more legible for general audiences, especially at larger print scales. They just reduce reading fatigue. For dyslexia, people with reading disabilities, sans serif fonts like Arial or Helvetica tend to be more readable. So that means in general, sans serif fonts are a good typeface to go with. When you use a font like this, just make sure to avoid the wall of text phenomenon by providing clear contrast in the text you provide in terms of text size, style, and weight. Again, those different dimensions of typography. Now, the last thing I want to talk about in this last section is very short, and this will lead us into our breakout activity of designing posters, is that 
when we communicate data, we're always telling some sort of story. And how we design a poster or a figure is very tightly intertwined with the specific stories we want to tell. So some common storytelling devices that we're always using in any kind of design are the things you see on the screen here. So showing how something changes over time or pointing out interesting factoids, things to pay attention to, drawing surprising connections between data points, relating our data to personal experience or revealing comparisons between different observations in the data set. So these different storytelling devices are essential to these different kinds of visualizations that we typically create. So a bar chart is great for that storytelling device of revealing comparisons. Line charts are great for showing changes over time. Scatter plots are great for showing connections between data points and observations. Pie charts are great for comparisons. And then lastly, Things like maps are great for relating to personal experience. And things like network diagrams are great for surprising connections as well. So when communicating the scientific data, it's really effective to lean heavily on these storytelling devices. And one really easy way to do that is to represent different scales of view into our data, just by providing different figures that give different perspectives into different slices of the thing we're trying to communicate. So as a couple of examples of these different scales of view, these are some visualizations from a, an article about 2019 and average temperatures and global climate change. And in this particular article, there are all these different visualizations that do things like provide a geographic view of the data. So here's a visualization showing uh, global land temperature change across the earth based on geographic region. So we get a geographic view of the data. In the same article, we get a temporal view of the data. So this is a time-based visualization that shows average temperature change over time. And then this visualization, we integrate both the geographic and temporal visualizations and prevent, uh, present both a short and a long view of the time period over which these data are changing. So providing these different slices of perspective can be really helpful in building in a story into a poster or a visualization. So most of the time in scientific data, we're working with very high dimensional data. So being selective about which slices of the data we present can be really helpful in clarifying what exactly is the story that we're trying to tell. So some common techniques in design for doing this kind of storytelling include things like small multiples. So in small multiples, we present the exact same visualization with the exact same data set, but each visualization presents a different specific slice of that data set. So in this example here, we have three different maps of the United States, and the states are colored based on average ozone air quality index at three different time points, 2000, 2005, and 2010. And small multiples like this provide a way of drawing comparison from one point to the next that really emphasize that changes over time aspect. Another common strategy is to use context and focus. So in this example, we have a scatter plot that shows changes in air quality index, ozone, over time for a particular region. And notice how color is being used to indicate different rate regions of healthiness or unhealthiness in the visualization. So color here, it really draws our attention to the unhealthy region of the visualization. And the color is used to provide a point of focus in the broader context of the overall data set. This particular figure uses a narrative structure that guides the reader through different slices of content. And each slice is a single visualization, and each slice provides a different focus point in the data. 
In this example here, the focus points are all very clearly differentiated from each other in very ex explicit ways. And then lastly, this example uses a strategy of showing three different levels of view into the thing it's talking about, a microscopic, mesoscopic, and macroscopic view that allows us to see the experiences of the individuals that are represented in this figure. The mesoscopic is the airport itself, the thing that the article is talking about. And then the macroscopic view is the cities in which this thing being observed is actually situated. So finding ways to build in these different levels of scale can help provide a storytelling device in itself as well. In all of this, remember that you are the expert of your own research, but your audience might not be. So composing your poster in a way that really exploits these storytelling devices can go an extremely long way in just making it easier for your reader to understand what's going on in your poster. So again, a whirlwind tour of a lot of different things to think about. And I encourage you to think about these things as parts of a toolkit. You may not need all of these things at any given moment, but as you design a poster or a figure, you might particularly notice the color aspect or the typography aspect. And these simple kinds of changes can go a long way in really accentuating the effect of those parts of the design. So I want to move into a, a workshop activity. Before I do that, are there anything, any questions I can answer about anything I just introduced or any other questions you have about poster or visualization design? Hi, Steven. I have a quick question about um, color choice. Um, so for a lot of the graphics, um, we were 